Hey there, listeners. This is Justin with a quick note before today's episode. Spotify recently allowed users to start leaving reviews for podcasts, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would consider listening to the show on Spotify, leaving us a positive review. I don't even think you have to write anything in. You just give a star rating and that's it. But uh, if you're willing to do that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks and enjoy today's show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military community thrive in their post-service career and life. Today is episode number 437 with Matt Zarencina. You know, blockchains are your know, decentralized systems, you know, distributed systems, and they're they're less efficient than centralized systems. And so when you think about it, you know, blockchains aren't meant to solve enterprise problems, they're meant to solve industry problems. Well, there is so much that Matt covers in our conversation today. I'll just highlight a few. He brings the perspective of what I'd call a midlife entrepreneur, someone who had a decade in the military, almost a decade of experience, a couple degrees before he founded a company. And I just always love hearing those stories. His company uses blockchain. So we talk about that, how that impacts his business, what that industry looks like, why it might be appealing to our listeners. He talks about COVID and how it actually helped him grow as a company and an unexpected way, a very atypical story. He talks about managing cash flow to the day, predicting when he was going to run out of money amidst the pandemic. He talks about playing Super Mario Brothers as an analogy for keeping a company alive and up-leveling. He talks about over-communicating in a crisis, how Navy pilots are like entrepreneurs, how you figure things out and supplement your knowledge in whatever career you do. He talks about how in career and life, it's a game of at-bats, not batting average. Really great point that I'm still thinking about. And he talks about how we're migrating from in-person, not not migrating from in-person to digital, but connecting the two and a really forward-looking thought of where the industry is going. As always at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes with links to everything we discuss. He has over six different recommendations for books, two of which I'm buying as we speak. And you'll find over 430 episodes just like this one, all offered for free. So with that, let's dive into my conversation with Matt. (laughs) Joining me today in Boston, Massachusetts, my guest is Matt Zarencina. Matt, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Justin, thanks for having me. So context for listeners, I've known Matt for years now, and we've just kind of kept in touch as fellow entrepreneurs. And I I feel like I've witnessed his journey from afar. And we connected uh, in the last month. And I was just like, dude, we got to get you on the show to hear more of your story. One, because I'm curious to hear it. Two, you know, not only is it an entrepreneurship story, but I, I know that COVID, you know, has had a big impact in different ways on their business, which was really interesting to see. And three, I just think he's been really smart about the way he's grown the team. They've got a lot of success and and I'm sure even more failures behind the scenes that have led to that. So let me give our listeners a quick background on Matt. He is the co-founder and CEO at True Tickets, which is connecting artists and performers with true fans through providing an end-to-end digital ticketing platform enabled by blockchain technology. He started True Tickets in 2017 and since then has raised over $11 million in venture capital and built a team of 20 people. He started out at the Naval Academy, spent over nine years in the Navy where he served as an HSL pilot in ROTC at Cornell with a one-year IA to Iraq. His career since the Navy also includes time at Deloitte as a consultant, in addition to earning both his master's in engineering and MBA at Cornell University. For the last four years, he has also been the head tutor of the Oxford Blockchain Strategy Program at Said Business School, which I'm probably mispronouncing, at the University of Oxford. So Matt, I always like to make space, first of all, anything to add? or amend to that bio? I did spend about two years at a company called Talos. So I, I was a part of it. So Talos is a French aerospace and defense company. I worked in their corporate US corporate innovation arm. So I was a director of innovation, led their blockchain project, their autonomous vehicle project, did a, a handful of other things there for two years. So between Deloitte and True Tickets, I did that for a little bit. For listeners, I'm going to focus a little bit more. You know, sometimes we talk more about the journey. And if we have time, we'll kind of go back to the journey. But one journey question that I had was, what was your first exposure to blockchain? Like, I know that's a really hot topic. It's not understood by myself or most people. When were you exposed to that? I'd say officially. So when I started my corporate (laughs) innovation job, I signed on a couple of months before I actually started. And my boss at the time said, 
you know, hey, uh, I think we're going to have you do the, our, you know, our lead our machine learning project. So I spent like three months brushing up on machine learning. And, and day one uh, in the Boston office for Explore, I walked in, this is December of 20, 2016. And I sat down and, you know, I was all ready to talk machine learning. And my boss goes, actually, you know, Matt, blockchain, go figure it out for Talus. And so <laughs> fortunately for me, my last project at Deloitte, I was actually at MIT and I was around a lot of the the blockchain experts at the time and the cryptocurrency experts. And so I literally just got back on the red line and went to MIT and started knocking on doors and said, Hey, uh, I need to figure out this technology a little bit. So I kind of jumped right in and that, that was the segue. So it was literally going, just going to people at MIT and asking for, it's so funny, man, because I feel like that's so much of entrepreneurship. And I feel like that was also like a lot of my experience on when I first was on a submarine of like <laughs> stopping people and asking them to explain complex topics to me. So what a great start. And then how long was it from then until when you launched True Tickets? Yeah, I started at Talos in 2016, it's a bit of a journey. And so I, I actually remember being in MIT, it was January of 2017. It's the second month on the job. And I was in a room at MIT and we were whiteboarding all sorts of different concepts that we could potentially explore for Talos, maybe it was supply chain, maybe it was you know, digital rights management, uh, other things of that nature. And I was, I was whiteboarding with an advisor to our company now, Thomas Harjano, who's out of MIT and actually now lives five blocks from me. So we go for walks every two weeks. It's, it's great to have access to that kind of thought leadership. But we got sidetracked at this whiteboard and in about a minute, we basically architected, or I mean, I shouldn't say architected, that's probably a little, you know, putting out what we did to uh, too high a degree, but we basically outlined, you know, how you know, blockchain could impact ticketing. And we both looked at each other and said, wow, this could be a really good use for this technology in the space. And kind of left it at that. We said, all right, you know, I'm of course working with a French aerospace defense company and they had literally just sold their ticketing arm. So there wasn't going to be any opportunity there. So I, I, I kind of forgot that conversation. And about you know, six months later, my co-founder, Steve, who was actually working, he and I went to flight school together and he was working on blockchain at the Pentagon, and we had kind of explored some opportunities to work together, said, hey, I have a white paper on kind of a crazy ticketing idea. And he sent it to me and I, I read it. And I said, wow, this is exactly what Thomas and I talked about six months ago. And that was probably summer of 2017. So we started ideating on it, putting pens to paper, building out you know, models, pitch decks, having some conversations. And we kind of conducted our first friends and family round and, and executed that in January of 2018. And at the same time, you know, my corporate innovation group, they actually reorged it. So they were getting rid of it. And I had an opportunity to be a senior director of airport security sales or try to go run my own company. And I was, I'd rather go try to run my own company than go be a senior director of airport security sales. Let's just say, like, I know no one knows this, but like, if they hadn't reorged, if it wasn't like at least a nudge for you to jump out on your own, do you think you would have just kind of like incubated on this on the side? Do you think you would have left anyways? Like, I'm just kind of curious if you would have been nudged out of the nest in a different way, or if this was really the universe was giving you to, to get you going. The reorgs helped, right? Yeah. So we knew somebody needed to run True Tickets at the time. And you know, we had a, a small set of employees and, and Steve at the time was was still committed to the US Navy. And so there was kind of a limited pool of people to actually to actually run it. And I would say that the reorg definitely was helpful. Had the reorg not happened, do I think it would have been more challenging or harder or would I have maybe incubated the idea longer? Potentially. You know, I, I think that that definitely could have happened. But in some ways it worked out for the best because you you really do have to jump right in, right? The, yeah. If you're keeping kind of one foot in your, your comfortable corporate job where you're making six figures and you've got 401k match and your healthcare, the job's fairly stable, it's easy to kind of have your, your side hustle, but then not fully commit to it because you know what you're leaving. And in the instance where where I was confronted with, you're right. It, it created a an opportunity for me to really explore this and, and not look back, right? There wasn't, it's not like, and I really did like the job at Explore. And I, I liked being the director of innovation. I liked the work we did. I thought it was, it was a really interesting work. I thought it was really interesting groups. I, I really did like that part, but the change did make the break pretty easy in that regard. And let's pause here for a second, especially for people not maybe terribly familiar with blockchain. If you were to, let's say you ran into some active duty army guy on the streets of Boston, and he's like, oh, Matt, what do you do for a living? How do you explain kind of like the company as well as like your role within it? Blockchain is a type of a database, right? So nobody, nobody ever goes, well, we're a SQL database company or we're a relational database company, right? So the, it's an aspect of what we deliver. How I describe True Tickets is we're a B2B enterprise SaaS solution for secure contactless digital ticket delivery. So think about you know point of sale to point of scan. We're an enforcement mechanism for the ticket. And our solution, we're built to be ticketing system and ticketing marketplace agnostic. So our goal is to work with anyone, right? And while that's applicable to blockchain, you know, blockchains are you 
decentralized systems, you know, distributed systems, and they're less efficient than centralized systems. And so when you think about it, blockchains are meant to solve enterprise problems, they're meant to solve industry problems. And so you know, that means that, you know, that translates into our goal, which is we really aim to be a trusted distribution provider for our partners. And we do that by coupling identity with accountability and ticketing. I just, I was making a note. I hadn't heard that phrase before, actually, where you said blockchain solves industry problems, not enterprise problems. Did, did I capture that right? Yep, 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 yep. The, I mean, I just, when I, when I hear that as someone, you know, in startups, when I hear that, I'm like, oh, that's industry disruptive. Like, that's like much bigger. <laughs> that's like inherently a big idea if you can pull it off, where it's like you're not just taking out a few companies, like you're shifting an entire industry. I appreciate that context. Let's talk about maybe, you know, I don't know if you view it in these terms, but like the pre-COVID and then like mid-COVID and post-COVID, what was that first leg of the journey like as you know, you've jumped off with your co-founder who's also a military veteran, you're you're starting the company. Take us through like what does that first year or so look like for you? Yeah, so the first the first year was twenty kind of twenty eighteen, right? And we actually set out. We built a, a B two C app, right? So consumer facing app, and we thought the best way to prove the efficacy and viability of what we're doing was build this consumer facing app, and that's going to help us prove out the concept. And look, we learned a ton in 2018. I'd say the biggest thing we learned was nobody wants another consumer-facing mm-hmm. ticketing app. Mm-hmm. And to an extent, there was a, a serendipitous meeting with you know us, myself, and, and our, our very first enterprise client in Miami of, of 2018, in November of 2018. And I remember sitting down with her and, and she said, hey, I, I heard you're doing something in blockchain and ticketing. I said, yeah, we have this app. And she goes, we don't want your app. I said, okay, (laughs) what would you like? She goes, can you figure out how to plug your ticketing, your solution into our ticketing system and make our ticketing system better? I said, yeah, we can probably figure that out. And that really was the the evolution of true tickets, right? So we we evolved from that B2C play to the B2B play. That really helped us, you know, 2018 was a a good learning lesson. And and if anything, we credentialized ourselves and proved ourselves in the market, right? So we were one of the few people who actually had something. I mean, even with the app, while it wasn't a lot, we did seven events and 20 grand in top line revenue and, and 1500 transactions on chain. So it was something, right? Which at that time, I'd say in 2018, there weren't a ton of people, especially in the US, who were actually building viable products. I think people were talking about it, but they hadn't actually built anything. And so, you know, that was one of those where the evolution was very helpful. COVID was in some ways the opposite, right? So sometimes you're confronted with a situation and you need to change. And for us, you know, it was the opposite that it was really something we needed to persevere through, right? So a little over two years ago, we had done our first production run of, of what is now, you know, the, the B2B service that we built. We did 24 tickets for Hamilton at the Adrian R Center in Miami. Uh, this was February 29th. We brought some investors down. We brought the team down, some friends and family. And, you know, the service worked great. We all got to see Hamilton. You know, fun fact is, is I had opportunities to see Hamilton prior to that show, but I made sure to hold off. And as I've told several people, I didn't want to see Hamilton until I could see it using our ticketing service. Yeah. That was kind of a personal win there. Um, and we were, we were all super excited about the future, right? I'm sure as we all were. Two weeks later, everything shuts down. Uh, and, and being a, you know, startups are hard. You know, being a, a founder is hard. You know, being, leading a startup is hard. And it, it's, it's lonely. And I would say, you know, look, the, the months of March and April of 2020 were, were not easy, right? I mean, you're, you're basically, I mean, you know, everything shut down. Uh, you know, we were in the middle of a raise at that point and a significant portion of committed capital had backed out. And that was challenging. You know, everybody was well into, I was receiving a lot of well-intentioned advice via emails, text, phone calls saying, you know, hey, we, we think you should pivot to streaming or hey, we think you should furlough your staff and just keep the lights on until things normalize. We, I had one that, you know, I, I got a, you know, an email that said, I think your business is going to die. I'm sorry. Right. And as a founder, you field all the advice, but you're responsible for actually the decisions you take. Right. And so one of the things that was very helpful for me was I remember reaching out to our clients and just, you know, once kind of things settled down a little bit, said, how do you feel about what we're doing? How do you feel about what we're building? How do you feel about the impact it's going to have? And at that time, we had one live client and, and four signed. And all of them came back to a client and said, look, you know, initially we were kind of thinking we we're going to use you for five to 10% of our tickets. But coming out of this, you think you could handle 100% of it? I said, okay, mm-hmm. all right. You know, for me, and that's why it was like the opposite of the end of, of 2018, right? 2018, it was, you know, we're confronted with a situation we have to change. COVID is, we're now confronted with a situation and it requires us just persevering. You know, I think we made that commitment to say, look, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and we're going to work to deliver to our clients. And 
you know, if they tell us that they want to give us a, you know, that they need us for hundred percent of our ticketing, then that's a great story to tell our investors. It's a great story to, to tell to our team. And so we just kept, you know, our focus where it was and, you know, look, we're not, you know, by any means, we're not necessarily across the chasm yet. We're still, you know, fairly early stage company, but I think we're in the best position we've ever been in. And I'm, I'm excited about where we're going. I'm trying to put myself back in that mindset, you know, especially the early days where it was like, we didn't really know how long it would go on for or what the new normal would be. How did you manage cash flow? Because I get the people who are saying like, dude, you got to skinny down your team and like cut expenses everywhere. And then at the same time, I'm seeing where you're like, you're smart enough and wise enough to see like, oh, there's actually an even bigger opportunity on the other side. And we can't necessarily cut everything and then show up in the way that we want to. So how did you, and, and I'm also cognizant, it sounds like you were kind of like right at the midst of about to close a round. And usually, you know, that comes at a time where you're, you're like really ready for a fe- fresh in- infusion of cash. So how did you think about how to manage expenses while also being poised to take advantage of this growth that could be a month or a year away? There's a couple of things you have to manage, right? So first and foremost, you know, our CFO, Steve, did a, a phenomenal job with, with our finances and our modeling to the point where I knew the exact day we would run out of cash. Yeah. So I, I knew down to the day. And, and as funds started coming in, that pushed that out, right? The other thing, too, that's super helpful with startups is, you know, my team probably gets annoyed with this, but I always use the plain Super Mario Brothers analogy, right? You're at a certain stage and you've got you know, 300 seconds or whatever the clock is to get from the start to the flagpole. And your reward for complete, successfully completing the level is you just get to go to another harder level. Mm. And so as we thought of what we were doing and, and different execution points, we started to think through, all right, in three months, what's it, what's something, a milestone we can hit or, or an execution point we can hit that we can advertise at that is a needle mover in value, right? Or that's going to incite, excite investors, that's going to compel investment, that's something going to, going to you know, compel traction. And I, that was the other thing that was key, right? Was we just focused on execution. We focused on what we could execute on. We really tried to be pretty near term in that. So, I mean, it, a good military planning phrase, right? Is the, the more stable your environment, the more strategic you can be, the more chaotic your environment, the more tactical you have to be. So we, we ended up being much more tactical in some degrees in what we were doing, how we executed, how we communicated that execution. But then to add to that on the side, you're constantly talking with investors, updating them. Uh, there was a lot of times where I just would set out an update you know, after two weeks. Hey, here's where we are. Here's what we're doing. Uh, here's the plan going forward. And you know, I kept those lines of communication open. I, I would say that I was probably overly communicative with our team and with our investors and with our partners, especially during that phase, because I think that the worst thing that can happen is you go quiet and then you pop back up in two months and maybe you have an ask. In this case, I just kept everybody informed and it, it worked out. You know, the, what, what I'm not talking about is there was a macro effect uh, you know, of the economy where the economy like blew up in a good way, right? So, I mean, if, if the economy doesn't have that turnaround where you have now this kind of angel investors were essentially flush with cash, right? So you get to the, the spring and summer of, of 2020, the market rebounds and actually you know, goes well above where it was prior to the, you know, the COVID crash. And you have these angel investors who are looking at public equity markets saying that's kind of expensive and I like startups, right? And so that made it, there are macroeconomic factors that are completely outside of our control that actually work to our benefit to a degree, right? The other macroeconomic factor in ticketing is ticketing has been one of those industries that's that's been slower to adopt technologies. And it look, it's, it's not because people in ticketing don't see problems. It's not because they don't know how to solve problems. Right. What people need to understand who aren't in the ticketing space is ticketing is a mission critical system. Mm. Right. If ticketing breaks, if you break ticketing once, you're done. So yep. the, the Silicon Valley mantra of you know move fast, break things, or or scale first and then figure it out literally doesn't work in ticketing because the minute you mess up someone's ticketing, you're done. Right. And so it's very much a you know a measure twice, cut once environment. Right. And that that was critical for us. And, and when you think about why ticketing was so slow to adopt digital. It's because the solution they had worked well enough. And what COVID did was created a, an atmosphere and an environment where venues and others issuing tickets could experiment a little bit more and experiment safely and make the moves that maybe they always wanted to move. But they had this kind of overarching umbrella of COVID that allowed them to kind of engage in probably decades of digital transformation in a period of months. And so that was a silver lining for us being a, a, a digital primary, you know, a digital first solution when you've got clients saying going from five to 10% usage to hundred percent, in some ways we just happen to be, you know, at the right place at the right time. 
I, I like the counterbalance of that though, too, where, I mean, like right place at right time, because you endured when many people told you to quit and you went through like horrific circumstances that I would never want to go through as a founder. <laughs> so I see the balance of both of those. One question I had too, this is completely off this vein, but um, when you first started, it's a very tech heavy solution from what I understand. How did you build out that tech team? Like how did you how did you build the actual infrastructure for the company? You know, it started in some ways we started with more you know contract dev to begin with. And then you are one of our essentially our very first you know tangible hire, Andrew Pinkham was our CTO, but I knew Andrew from when we worked at Talis. You know, the second second big hire was our, our head of business development, Ken. Um, Ken was formerly at a blockchain startup that was the only one that was acquired by a ticketing company, Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster bought his startup in, in October of 2018. And one of our investors was connected with him and, and he didn't want to go to Ticketmaster. And he thought there's there's a huge opportunity here still. In fact, a bigger one than, than the one I just left. And so those were our two big hires. And then from there, you know, it was really you know, just kind of figuring out what your needs are, right? And I'm kind of giving a, you know, not a not a very clear answer, but it's not like we had necessarily a roadmap of, all right, we need these people to do these things. It was really just kind of saying, all right, what are the most immediate needs? And are those long-term needs? You know, are those short-term needs? And for the long-term needs, we started to grow people or started started to bring people into the company um, that we thought would be be good fits. Now, well, we've definitely did been done a better job of of growing the team here in this past year is we've definitely reorganized into a more product focused team. So we've gone from kind of a, a large kind of technical team or product team to essentially multiple product groups. Mm. And so we're, we're much more focused on product. We've started to bring in product managers, technical leads to really lead product development. And we're starting to see the impact of that on our solution, not only on the quality of the solution, but how quickly we're able to develop solutions. So I'd say the, the early on, it was, you know, we just had only X amount of cash and we kind of had X amount of needs and we tried to do the best to figure out, fit the cash we had with the, the needs we could fulfill. And we're starting to be more strategic and we're really building our team to be a team that can be scaled from, you know, 20 people to 200 people. And wow. so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Well, the changes we've made and, and specifically focusing on product, specifically focusing on outcomes, right? So, you know, never confuse um, you know, effort with progress, right? Mm. Never confuse output with outcomes. So obviously, especially as a startup, you, you know, if you're going to be successful, you have to find that one scalable thing that you can execute on, right? It's so easy to get distracted or want to focus on other things, but, you know, core to your success is finding that, that one kind of major pain point that you can solve better than anybody else and getting that out to market. And that, that then unlocks doors, right? Those are like keys. They unlock doors for other future opportunities that you can, you can explore when the time's right. When you were first starting, it sounded like this company in Florida kind of pulled you into this direction of shifting from a consumer app to more of the what you're doing now. As you have like these product groups, as you have, I'm guessing, a much more feature-rich product, what's your sense on like how much of that is customers pulling you in it and like kind of dictating your roadmap or kind of guiding you on that? versus your team, you know, seeing the matrix and seeing where things need to go. And I know it's not like a clear distinction between those two, but I'm just kind of curious if that balance has shifted over time where you own it more or if it's still just listening to clients what they're what they're needing. It's it's a mix of both, right? Obviously, look, you don't have products dictated to you. Yeah. Uh, I think there's the, you know, I'll, I'll kind of butcher paraphrasing Henry Ford, but if you ask customers what they wanted, they, they wouldn't have set a car, they yeah. would have set a mechanical horse, Yeah. right? So you know, one of the things when it comes to focusing on, on outcomes is really just understanding you know, the pain point. So a lot of times when we start talking with current clients or prospective clients, it's tell us all the nightmares that you deal with in ticketing today. Just tell us problems, tell us the pain points. Tell us the things that just make your job awful. Mm -hmm. And then what we try to do is understand you know, what are the capabilities of our service and, and what we're building and what are the outcomes from those pain points that they can affect or they want to affect, right? So what do they want to drive? And then it, you, once we understand their pain points, the outcomes they want to affect and the capabilities of our service, you start to align and say, okay, do we enable that today? Can we enable that tomorrow? And, and a lot of it's just exploration and discovery, right? So I think you have to have a team that is, isn't focused on walking in with the, the solution already pre-baked, right? That is, is very hard, you know, as an engineer, right? I, I'm an engineer by trade and you know, you've got a, you know, a engineering background coming from Navy. It's one of those where uh, you, we kind of want to walk in and already have like an idea of what the solution should be. And so I think that the biggest learning for me and our team is to walk in and listen, but, you know, encourage our clients to not already have, 
you know, a solution baked in, but let's, let's try to understand, you know, maybe, cause maybe there's a new solution we haven't thought of, right. That's out there that we can engage, right. I mean, you're moving from a physical environment to a digital environment. That's a lot of change, right. And that's actually a lot of opportunity. And so I think sometimes people get caught up into, well, you know, here's what we did with a physical ticket. We should just replicate that in, in the digital world. You know, I, I think you're missing out on a, a massive, you know, massive potential opportunity for engagement and efficiencies uh, and all sorts of other things that that you can enable um, by kind of already walking in with the solution predisposition. So I would say that we collaborate with our clients. We're very you know, product and, and outcome focused, but I would say that you know, we try not to kind of walk in with a, a preconceived notion of what what the answer is. We try to be very open to you know, new potential answers and ways of doing things and. And again, COVID has been very helpful with our clients. They're much more open to looking at their ways of working and, and questioning why do they do the things they do. And I think having that open mind is so critical to being successful um, long term. One thing that's fascinating about your story, and I might be misinterpreting it from an outside perspective, but I see in you someone who has, um, let's call it nearly a decade of experience in the Navy or the military. You have over half a decade in consulting with Deloitte. You have two master's degrees. And so the story that I'm telling myself is like, wow, you had a tremendous amount of experience before you started your own company versus a little bit more social media fit centric 21 year old who does it. Right. And I think that's really interesting. And then I also think of like, wow, you had 15 years in very large organizations, and then you're literally building something from the ground up. And I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on ways in which that depth of experience helped you, and also what allowed you to switch from really large structured environments to guerrilla warfare, you know, creating the rules <laughs> as you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So- Interesting question. And there's a book I read recently called Super Founders. And one of the questions in the book, one of the, I, actually, it's more of a myth, right? One of the myths is, you know, do you have to be, you know, a 20 something, you know, Stanford dropout, right? To, to be a successful founder. And, and his data shows most successful companies are started by you know, people in their 40s. Right. So I think there's there's this this myth out there that you know to, to build a you know as much as I hate the phrase unicorn, right? You you have to be this you know 20 something wunderkind, uh, super uber intelligent person that sees something no one else sees. And look, uh, there there definitely are stories out there like that, right? But you know, I wouldn't say that the, the data necessarily supports that. From the experience standpoint, yeah, I mean, obviously, look, the, the U.S. Navy is hundreds of thousands of people. Deloitte's hundreds of thousands of people. Talos employs tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people. That said, the individual experiences are very different, right? As a pilot, in some ways, you kind of are a bit, at least a Navy pilot, kind of are an entrepreneur. The minute the minute I took off the deck, that was my aircraft. The Admiral of the Air Wing could tell me to do something and I could say no. Right. Because if I did something wrong, I'm the pilot in command. I'm the one who has to sit in front of the board. Right. So in that instance, you know, being a pilot was kind of nice because you could run your own mission. Right. You had a lot of flexibility um, in, in how you conducted yourself. You know, at Deloitte, again, Deloitte was a big organization, but you know, I was consulting on teams of teams of five, teams of 10. And you're walking in and you're being presented with a problem and you have to solve a problem. Sometimes you solve a problem in two weeks, sometimes you solve a problem in two months. Sometimes problem, you know, you're solving it in, in 10 months. And so while it's a big organization, I would say that you know, consulting was super helpful for me because it, it just gave me a lot of exposure. And, and I do like to joke that consulting is a halfway home for you know, the professionally undecided. You don't know what you want to do. So you go into consulting and you're like, oh, you know, I, I want to get paid well, but I don't want to pigeonhole myself into one specific thing. And I had done some innovation work at Deloitte and I liked it. And, and the job at Talos seems super interesting. And and so, you know, just like consulting is a halfway home for the profession I decided, you know, corporate innovation is a halfway home for startup wannabes. You know, you want to wear jeans and a polo to, to work and you want to talk with cool startups. You, you know, you want to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a part of this big corporate machine. I'm, I'm doing this like leading edge stuff. And, and part of my progression, that was by intent, right? So I, I went into corporate innovation with the thought like, look, maybe I'll discover something that, that I want to build or discover an opportunity that I want to get after. If you would have told me it would have been... In ticketing and with blockchain, I probably wouldn't have said that in, in December of 2016. But you know, I was always open to what the opportunity was going to be. So I, I would say that 
my experience this date kind of prepared me for the moment I'm in, or I'd like to believe it did. But everybody else has their journey, right? There's, I'm sure there's you know, 19 year olds, 21 year olds who are starting their own companies and that's all they want to do. And there's, look, there's nothing wrong with it. Everybody else has their journey and mine has worked for me. Would I, hopefully my journey, maybe for you know, older professionals, more mature professionals who are in their 30s or 40s or even 50s or potentially even 60s. You know, if they're watching this and thinking like, oh, I'm, it's, it's beyond me, you know, I wouldn't say that at all. You know, I think, you know, if you've got an opportunity and you've got a passion and you think you can, you can have an impact and you can build something, then, you know, if, if the time's right for you, the time's right for you. What about, you know, you mentioned the book Super Founder, and I'm curious, like your take of not to overly simplify, but let's say that there's like a pie chart here of how you're growing as an entrepreneur, as a leader, and as a business owner. Some component of that is the experience you brought that you just mentioned, like what you bring into this. But some component of it is you're learning on the job right now just by doing and getting so many reps on a daily basis. But the part I get really curious about is like, what is the percentage where you're learning right now from peers or books or programs? And what are some of those that you would recommend for listeners who might be on deployment or might not have access to running a company, but want to start getting those reps in in advance? I think when you start out, you you probably rely more on your past experience. I think part of it too is maybe you're not you're not quite comfortable with your ability to learn as quickly. So you want to just rely on something that's comfortable. I would say that over time I've become more comfortable with a little bit of the ambiguity, a little bit more of the the unknown, and knowing that okay, I don't have the, the, the right answer today, but I'm going to get it or I'm going to figure it out or I, I can stitch some things together. The intellectual curiosity and the, the, the being willing to adapt to circumstances and, and just grow personally and professionally on, of your own fruition, that's a huge aspect of it. So if I was to say, if I was to give it a percent, maybe it's like 25% you know, background knowledge, I'd say 50% is probably that intellectual curiosity and just being able to figure it out on the fly. Um, I've had so many people, I start having conversations about raises or contract development or client conversations and all sorts of things. And, and a lot of people are like, how did you learn that? And you kind of like, well, you just, you just kind of figure it out. And it, maybe it's the rest, the other quarter is, you know, that supplementing, right? So I've actually read a lot more in this job than I think I've read in any other job, which is maybe counterintuitive. There's some great books out there. One I liked was Loon Shots. Uh, I think that's a phenomenal way of thinking about, you know, keeping an organization in dynamic equilibrium. You know, I'd say it was a super founder. So it's a good one. I've recently read play bigger, which is a great one. The mom test is another good one. Resonates a good one. Marty Kagan's, you know, product books around inspired, empowered, or good. I'd have to go through my, my Kindle to kind of figure out a couple more because um, I'm probably just rattling off the most recent ones, but yeah, I find myself, reading a good bit more. I mean, shoot, even um, your Tech Review 2020, 2022, HBR Tech Review 2022. Uh, there was a piece in there by a professor who I I uh, took a class with at Cornell and it was he was doing something in blockchain and supply chain, but I really liked how he talked about blockchain and, and I, I picked pieces from that. So I, I think you can kind of learn from anything, New Yorker articles, Economist articles. Um, so just, just kind of being open to, if you see somebody doing something in a space, and talking about something in a in a unique way. So, for example, Vishal in, in the, the supply chain article in the HBR Tech Review really talked about your know, blockchain providing three fundamental kind of keys, right? And if three fundamental flows, one is you know inventory flow, the second is information flow, the third is financial flows. And I thought that was such a great way to to couch you know blockchain and its ability to provide different sets of information to multiple parties and create efficiencies. You know, it's something that I'll probably be incorporating as I talk about true tickets and ticketing. I'm always kind of trying to gain and gather information to think through you know, what can I pick up and help maybe tell a story a little bit better or tell something in, in a more clear and concise way. Because I think that, that's the biggest challenge you have as a founder when you're talking about something in emerging tech is, look, it's complicated, right? And, and how can you simplify it without losing the impact? And for listeners at, at beyondtheuniform.org, I'll have links to all of those books. I think I'm going to, I have Play Bigger. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to buy Loon Shots and Super Founder for sure. But I'll have a link to all of those books there. You're maybe the fourth or fifth pe person in 
three years that had some sort of blockchain experience. And the last was probably over a year ago. I know that's like just an aspect of what you're doing, but I always think of like that as a potentially really exciting opportunity for people getting out of the military or maybe even career switchers who are listening to the show. Do you have a sense for kind of like advice to people looking to enter into the blockchain chain space that could be pros and cons, that could be kind of like things that people don't know, but what, what advice do you have for them in evaluating this? Well, a couple of things. If you're, if you're just getting out of the military, I'd say don't start a company. I think that's actually probably <laughs> the worst thing to do. Not because you couldn't do it. I, I think there's one of the things that was very helpful for me, business school was a little bit of a halfway home between the civilian world and the, and the military world. And it was helpful. And, and consulting was helpful for me and just learning the language of business and getting my feet under me and getting to a point where I felt confident. Yeah, you know, I think for those getting out of the military, try to find maybe a place that's a little bit less risky than starting your own business. Because I think it's a lot harder than anybody really appreciates. Even I felt when I started this company, I felt I was going in with my eyes wide open and, and to some extent, I probably wasn't prepared for the, the true reality of yeah. what it is. You, know, you kind of see, you see it on the outside and you're like, oh, you know, I, I won't make those mistakes or I'll, I'll see this and, and I'll have, you know, I'll be able to deal with this a little bit better. But I, I would encourage anybody getting out of the military, maybe take advantage of some programs, get in with the company, get, it, get, get your feet under you to maybe understand how the non-military world works because that might help you out a little bit. In the blockchain space, I would probably take a step back and not say necessarily the technology, but you know, find companies that are solving problems you think are problems you're passionate about solving, right? And then, then if the technology you're interested in happens to align, then that's a great opportunity to explore, right? So I think it's one of those where if you focus on the tech specifically, and then let's say you, you're enamored with it today, but six months from now, a year from now, you're not that enamored with it, you, you may be upset about your decision. Versus if you're you know, passionate about a specific pain point or a specific outcome you're hoping to achieve, and you happen to find a, an opportunity or a company that's solving it in a way that's leveraging emerging tech that you're also interested in, I, I think that's probably a better way to go about it. Because you know, look, I would say, for example, with ticketing and blockchain, I, I think blockchain is a, a proven technology broadly. Is blockchain, has it been proven in ticketing yet? No. Is it going to be proven out in the next year to three years? Most likely there is a world where you know maybe blockchain, the applicability to ticketing isn't there. Maybe there's other ways to solve it in a non-blockchain way. And you know, one of the things that's nice about for tickets is we are architected for that potential future if it comes to fruition. Um, so I think being kind of aligned just with the tech could set you up for failure, you know, in the future. So I, I would say focus on kind of maybe an industry, a pain point, an outcome you're hoping to achieve, and then align it with some tech. Because that way, if, if the tech changes, but you're still passionate about the problem you're solving, you know, then then you'll still be learning and growing and happy with your decision. Mm. One thing, you know, when I talk with people, I love to take notes. And this may have been from a long time ago, but I had in my notes from a conversation we had, you had said something, it's okay if you don't remember this, but you had said that it's a game of at-bats, not batting average. And I'm just kind of curious, like, could you unpack that? Like, what, what did you mean by that? So, for example, like getting investors. If you go one for three in a game, your batting average is what, you know, 333, right? But you only got one investor versus... If you have 500 conversations and you get 100 investors, technically your batting average is worse than having been one for three, right? But you have 100 investors versus the person who has one investor. And you know, in startups and client conversations and investor conversations and recruiting, in many ways, you know, it is a game of at bats, not batting average, right? Like you just need to get up to the plate and, and take a swing. Um, especially, look, I definitely stay on the investor side, right? I mean, you're I've gotten hundreds of no's, and some of those no's have become yeses at some point, right? And and again, it's being able to walk a fine line of you're not badgering, but being informative, staying connected, developing a, a sense for you know, when to engage an investor, when not to. But you know, you only get those learnings by just you know, getting up at the plate, right? So if you get up the plate once, you hit a home run and want to walk off the field, that's great. But if you're really working to be successful, you know, you're you're going to go up and you're going to get a lot of cuts in, and sometimes you're going to strike out, and sometimes you're going to get hit. But you know, to become a better hitter, you need to get those cuts in. It's such a great perspective for for everything, unless you're like I don't know diffusing bombs or something. I feel like that's yeah, such a great that, that I don't want. That I would not want. Yeah, yeah. In the startup world it works. Uh, you know, EOD not so much. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your answering all my questions. I always like to leave the last question open ended, which is: Is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to make sure listeners know before we wrap up? I would say that you know, when it comes to the the event space, right? So there's there's a lot of talk about the metaverse and the digital sphere. 
what I am excited about and what I think is going to come to fruition isn't, isn't a migration from the physical to digital, but it's actually an interconnection. Mm. So when you think about, look at how important live events are and the in-person events are just to us as people and our culture and it's the connection of the two, right? So it's going to a performance at Boston Symphony. It's going to a game at Fenway Park. And then it's it's somehow being transported into a digital world where there's some element of, of digital scarcity, digital uniqueness. But it's it's an engagement then that compels us to come back, to want us to come back to the physical world. And, and I think, you know, when we think about where technology is going and what it enables, I don't see it as a migration from the physical to the digital. I, I think the truly profound solutions are going to be these, these solutions that, integrate the two, right? And that enable the two, right? So create these gateways from the actual verse to the metaverse mm-hmm. and, and back. And, and I think that that's going to start to transpire and, and gain traction here in the next you know, five to 10 years. And, and I'm excited for what that ends up being, because I think there's so much potential um, to connect the two. And right now they're, they're viewed as maybe as a little bit at odds, right? Like they're competing against one another versus I, I think there's going to be a world of, of cool opportunities and experiences that are opened up when those two, when, when those worlds are bridged. Mm, that's great. That's great. Well, Matt, I know we only got a, a fraction of your story, but it's so riveting to hear. And I love your mindset on this. And I love the perspective that you're bringing this. So I, and I'm sure our listeners are looking forward to seeing your continued success on this, but thank you for taking time from a very full schedule to, to share your journey with us today. No, happy to do it, Justin. Always good to chat. Surface, surface, surface. <laughs> Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with the help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, our Editor, Lex Brown, and our Head of Social Media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First of all, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 380 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but just don't have nearly the resources to do it. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. Third of all, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 380 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career in life.